like a like a brother to me, and uh, like part of the family, and uh, uh, we've known each other for a long time, and and he's a blessing, he's a very uh, uh, mature minister of the word. You know, sometimes you fill out those things, and I always say, no, he's a, this is a very mature. He is not a novice. Um, he's fought the good fight of faith. And he's, he's got a wonderful wife, two, two uh, wonderful boys, takes being a father very seriously, just like me, and everything like that, and preaching. You're going to be blessed today. Give him a warm welcome as he comes this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Hallelujah. Good morning. So good to be here. My name is David Fleming. I'm from uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, but originally I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's good being home. Even though I've been gone for decades, I keep coming back every chance I get. We are still big pirates and Steeler fans. Um, my, my boy sends you greetings. My wife sends greetings. They're not able to travel with me. I'm a traveling minister. We are travelers and traveling all over the country. A couple weeks ago, we were in uh, North Carolina and Georgia and South Carolina. A couple weeks before that, I was up in Warren, Ohio uh, with a bunch of Cleveland fans. God is doing something even in Cleveland area. Can you believe that? <laughs> Hallelujah. My family sends greetings. I'm, I got uh, two boys here, eight and six, having too much fun. God has been so good to us. I think I told you last time about the story how uh, uh, they had a lesson about David and Goliath, right? Uh, don't you just love anointed people who work with the children, some creative ideas? We ran into a lady one time who was doing a lesson about David and Goliath, and she had like a big cardboard cutout of Goliath, you know, bigger than life size. And she got these socks for the kids and put a sock inside of the sock, and all the kids got to practice slinging the, the sling hitting Goliath. And don't you know we did that for the next two years at my house? Had to teach the boys what we put in the sock here. <laughs> and we're not, not putting the hard balls in there. We're, we were acting it out one day. I came around the corner and the, the boys were, you know, were acting this story out. And they, they stopped the story. Dad, Dad, come in. You got to help us. Dad, you got to be Goliath. Come in and be the Goliath in the story. Because, Dad, because you're so tall. <laughs> that was the first time in my life anybody ever called me tall. Yeah, they were just little guys at the time. I paused right there. So hold on a second. Let me get your mother. Babe, babe, come in here. Babe, come in here. Now tell your mother what you just told me. <laughs> we're having too much fun. You know, uh, God has been good to us. We've been playing uh, hide and go seek with the darts, right? They've grown up. They've elevated. Now we're, we're doing the little, those nerf darts, you know, and uh, I'm having too much fun as a dad. This is wonderful. We turn out the lights. I went and got eye protection, got eye protection from the Home Depot, right? We're doing this safe and we're sneaking around the house, but come on, I'm smarter than them, right? So I'm like standing on the bathroom counter, right? <laughs> Changing the angle. So they come around looking at me like eye level and I'm up at the ceiling. Ba -ba 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 -bam. <laughs> I, got a, I got a hot water tank in the center of my house. So they're on the corner of the the hallway, I've got two air return vents, so I get down on my belly, and I can see through one corner to the other corner. I see them, they don't know this, I see them coming, and ba bam come out and shoot them, or sometimes I just put the little night lights there. You know, you've got a motion detector night light, put that in the rooms. So I turn out the lights, and they walk in, the, they try to sneak in, and then the light comes on, and we're having so much fun. So they send their greetings. God's been good to us. But it's been good to come back to uh, Pittsburgh and join spring. The rest of the country's been in spring for about two months now. I think you guys are about to get this in maybe about two, three weeks. Just wonderful coming up through here. You know, another thing, a number of things that we do out on the road, love teaching about people getting involved, doing something in the church, right? This is what we talked about when I was here. Got a couple of messages still online there. Just inspiring people to get involved, do something, serve Jesus, right? There's something great. God has been so good to us. And we talked about last time I was here, we're going to kind of dovetail a couple of points again today. God has been so good to us, and it's from that heart, right? You need a revelation of how good God has been to you.
On the Sunday night when I was here, we talked about this also, about how good God has been to us. He's been so good to us through Jesus Christ. And the the grace of God is so great, it's got to be revealed to you. The love of God is something that is so wonderful, you can't logically conclude with your brain that God loves you like you can 2 plus 2 equals 4. No, it's got to be revealed to you. But thank God, that's why Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. Spirit. He said in John 16, he said, it's better for you if I go away, because when I go, I'm sending the Holy Spirit with you, and he's going to be inside of you. He's going to be with you. He's going to take from me and reveal it to you. And so the Bible says that when you become born again, how do you become born again? You, re- you believe the story of Jesus Christ. You realize, I need help. Have you come to that point yet? Right? Really, as believers, we kind of stay in that spot, don't we? We realize, man, I needed help to get born again, and uh, man, I still need help every single day. And so we're dependent upon God. We're dependent on the Holy Spirit to help us. But Jesus said that Holy Spirit's going to be with you. And the Bible said he is the revealer. The very one you need, the Bible says, will always be with you. Jesus said, I'm going away. I'm going to send him. I'm not leaving you orphans. So we told my story. We're just going to cover this a little bit, catch some people up to speed. We told you my story, uh, how I was growing up. My dad was a pastor of a church. I don't know if you know this, but when your dad is the pastor, you are automatically a volunteer in the church. (laughs) Hallelujah. We've had a wonderful example here this morning. When did you dream about playing the drums? Years ago. And I believe the church gives us so many great opportunities to get involved and to do something, you know. If we look, uh, why don't you turn with me in your Bibles. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, we'd like to launch from this spot here. We're going to talk about the gifts that God has given to us. And then from those gifts, we see that there's something for us to do. Come on, turn to your neighbor, tell them, say, we need you. Come on, turn to your other neighbor, say, we really need you. So in Ephesians chapter 4, before we get started, let's just pray and ask the Holy Spirit for help here today. Father God, we come before you today. We magnify the name of Jesus. We lift up Jesus Christ. He is Lord. Thank you so much, Father God, for what Jesus did for us. We're so grateful. Hallelujah. Father, we come before you today because of what Jesus did for us. So we just thank you for the opportunity to gather here together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to anoint us, to teach, anoint us, to hear. Father God, we go out of here and it will never be the same. Thank you, Father God. We give you all the praise, all the glory. May Jesus Christ be the most glorified, the most exalted here today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, so it starts out in verse 7. Each one of us, grace is given, right? You have a grace, you have an ability, right? There's something great about you. It's been deposited on the inside of you by God. And so this morning, we're going to give you a whole lot about serving, right? This is just my story. I just grew up serving, right? My dad was in the church, and I was just a part of this. But I also knew I was called to the ministry, so I was just headed that way. I didn't mind serving, enjoyed it. And then I went to Bible school. So for me, the question when I went to Bible school wasn't, should I get involved? It was, where should I get involved? So I've done all kinds of things in the church. I worked as an usher for a couple years right? Helping to direct people, you know, where to go. It's where I learned how to greet people. It's where I learned how to smile at the same time. (laughs) The Holy Spirit's going to help you. He's going to help you get involved. And so there's something about serving where the Holy Spirit is trying to get you into position, right? This is the attitude of the kingdom. This is who we are. We don't have one of those gospels where once you find out about Jesus, you just go to the mountain and you're by yourself. No, there's something great. The Holy Spirit brings us together. And now when you begin to follow that leading on the inside of you, you get that story of grace. And grace causes you to look around to see who else is out there. 
But it starts with that story, that abundance that comes on the inside of you. We go on and read in verse 11. It says, he himself, Jesus Christ, gave gifts to the church. It says he, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why did he give these gifts? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so there is a purpose to this, right? God established Jesus Christ as the head. Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit to help you. He said, I'm going to build my church. He said, I'm going to use you to do it. In fact, one of his last instructions before he left earth and went to heaven, he told the disciples, he said, now wait for the Holy Spirit because you are going to be witnesses for me. And he began to describe the same way he described his whole ministry on earth. These signs will follow those who believe. He began to list things off. He who believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Teach them to do what I'm telling you to do. And then that final instruction, he said, you're going to receive power. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to go to Judea, to Jerusalem, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And now we get born. Again, we come in line. So I want to encourage you to find your spot in the local church. Yeah, I know you're not going to find the perfect church. I get it. Right? Years ago, Andrew Carnegie, we're in a good part of the country for this. Andrew Carnegie said working with people is like uh, work, digging for gold. You're going to come across a lot of dirt. He said, but you're not looking for dirt. You're looking for gold. And aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit is working with you, right? Helping you find the gold that's on the inside of you, the gold that sends people on the, uh, all around you. So the scripture says here that these gifts are given for the perfecting of the saints. That's me. That's you, right? So you don't learn everything and then begin. No, we're a work in progress. You get started at the same time while you're learning. So what that means is you should be nicer today than you were a year ago. Come on now. Are we in the right spot? We're going to be nicer in a year than we are today. Why is that? Because revelation is coming to us. Right, because the Holy Spirit is with us. So these gifts are given for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. When you break this down there in the Greek, it's painting the picture of coming alongside and helping someone else. This is what we do. This is who we are. And what I love about the local church is it gives you the opportunity to serve. It's not the only place to serve. Right? We're going to be upfront about that. I'm going to give you a whole lot about the local church today. I think it's the best place. I think it's the easiest place to jump in. I don't know what I can do. I don't know who I am. Come in and help us. We're going to find something for you. So I started out, right? I graduated from Bible school and the church called me up. We want you to come work for us. All right, this is my chance. I'm going to go preach. And they said, will you cut the grass for us? Uh, That was not my dream. Picking up trash, oh, planting flowers. Oh, I remember we had a bad job one time. So there I'm, I'm on this, uh, this grounds crew at the church, right? It's a 110-acre campus, so there's 15 of us on grounds. That's all we did. 40 hours a week, 52 weeks out of the year, we're just, we're either planting flowers, pulling up flowers, right? Cutting the grass, blowing leaves, you know, scraping. And, and another tra- job we had was picking up trash, So I'm just a young guy just trying to figure out what I can do, right? I'm ready to take on the world. I was 22. I started working there. What can you do? I don't know, but I'm going to rule the world. (laughs) So I started in the youth. I started cutting the grass. And the the, the, uh, jobs had come down. We need somebody to go pick up the trash. That's a bad job. You know, there's one particular story there in my church. Uh, they've got a daycare, one of the biggest daycares in the state of Oklahoma. So there's a, there's a housekeeping crew all over campus too, right? And my, my church is famous for having really clean bathrooms, really clean hallways. And so the concept is, is that the housekeeping guys would gather up the trash. What do they do with it? Well, the guys in the garage went and found this old trailer, right? Put sides on a roof on it and put it on the backside of the church. And housekeeping guys would fill that up with trash and then... 
They said, well, who's going to empty this? Well, the, get the grounds guys to do it, right? We were at the, the low man on the totem pole. So that's, I'm in the crew. I'm not running the crew, but I'm in the crew. And I'm telling you, this was a bad job, right? <laughs> Full of trash. Nobody wants to do it, so we just let the trash fill up and fill up and fill up, right? Ignore it. And then finally, the housekeeping guys can't get any more bags in it, right? They're pushing on the door, trying to close it. Highly inefficient. Those, gra- those housekeepers, I got to tell the, the building supervisor who tells the, the head of housekeeping, who tells the head of the warehouse, who tells the, the head of the end of my department, or who tells the head of grounds, who finds a, a ground leader. Pity the poor grounds guy walking through the warehouse when that call comes through. You got to go empty that trailer. Because of the daycare, this trailer became affectionately known as the diaper trailer. <laughs> Right? But that Holy Spirit is with us, right? And he's bringing us to that place of perfecting us as saints, right? And he's bringing us into the place of working with people. You know, I'll be honest with you. I've done so many projects. I've worked with thousands of people. And I really believe one reason why I'm up here today is because I've done thousands of things behind the scenes that no one knows. But just like King David in the Old Testament, just like Joseph being faithful, I was faithful to give it my best right where I was. And I believe that's one reason why the Holy Spirit has me up here today, encouraging you, inspiring you. And so the Holy Spirit is with you every single thing that you're doing, every single person you interact with, right? And I really believe that there's something about serving that that is deliberate. The Holy Spirit's trying to bring transformation into your life, and he's going to do it through serving. It's one way that he does it. See, if you sit by yourself, I can sit across from you in in church, right? Sit across the aisle from you for years and just think, oh, you're just a wonderful person. You sit across from me in church and say, man, he looks sharp. He must be an incredible guy, right? But there's something, right, when we get around people, I believe one reason why he brings us together is because the quickest way to figure out we got a problem here is to get you around other people. (laughs) But the Holy Spirit is not interested in in telling on you. He's trying to get you into a place where that blood of Jesus will come in, right? It says in Hebrews, it cleanses the conscience of the worshiper, but he's got to get you to ask for help. I still need help with people. So here I am as a grounds guy. We're all fighting over who's doing what. We got our diplomas somewhere here. I'm supposed to be preaching. Asking me to pick up the trash. So one morning we're reading the Bible. Do you remember this passage in Colossians chapter 3? Colossians 3, 17, the apostle Paul tells us, whatever you do, do it as, as work hard as unto the Lord and not unto men. Oh, that's just wonderful. It's so great a concept in verse 23, 24. He repeats it again a couple verses later. Everything that you do, everything, you're not working for man, you're working for God. So there at this particular uh, season working for the church, uh, different groups, we would all get together. First thing we did, the whole ministry, all of us, reading the Bible in small groups together all over the ministry from 8 to 8.15. Went through the the one-year Bible. We're reading it all together. And on this particular passage, right, it's a slow morning. It's a sleepy morning, right? You're just getting ready to work. Here we go again. And and we're reading the Bible. We came to that passage, Colossians 3. And there, I tell you, I had a vision that morning. Yeah, a vision from God. Whatever you do, do it heartily into the Lord. And I remember looking up, and I saw before me the diaper trailer. Oh, not so, Lord. Get thee behind me, Satan. (laughs) No way. I I want dreams about preaching. That's what I want to. Where am I going to go? I want to get out of here. I want (laughs) to. The diaper trailer, really. And so many times we want to negotiate with the Holy Spirit. Surely not you. Not you guys. I'm I'm just talking about me. I want to negotiate. Well, what if I, what if I do, what, if, what about this job? What if I'm nice to this nice person, right? Come on, Holy Spirit, this person, this person here, they look so much nicer. How, why can't I come here? Why can't I do this? And he just puts something in front of you. And so 
I didn't really read the rest of the passage that morning, just a few minutes left, but I'm just decided, right? And I, and I came to a quick conclusion. I'm going to do it. I'm going to give my best. We had two teams. We would alternate the responsibility of doing the diaper trailer. And so and I just determined right there between the Holy Spirit and I. Okay, the week that I'm on the crew, I'm not running the crew. I'm not in charge of the crew. I'm not in charge of grounds. He was talking to me that day. And I said, okay, the week that I'm on this team, they will never call to say the job is not done. And I really wish that I could tell you that when you step out to make a commitment, that it is the easiest thing that you're going to do. I wish I could tell you that when you commit to do something for God, that every time you wake up in the morning, the birds are there, the sun is shining. It's like the angels come get you out of and and the hot water is working and your clothes are ready. I wish I could tell you that. There's times when you make that commitment, all of a sudden when you're following up that commitment, there's times you feel like you are just by yourself. God, did, did, am I doing this by myself? Are you going to help me with this? And so I emptied it out a couple of times. Then we had the week off, right? I come back about 10 days later and I forgot about the diaper trailer. But the Holy Spirit, come on, he's always with you. He nudges me. Hey, how about that trailer? Oh, man. Did you, were you recording that, right? You think it to the Holy Spirit. Did, was that, did I really commit to that? Did I really say I was going to do that? And so I, you know, limped through the week, emptying it out. Just over the next few weeks, over the next few months, every time I came back on a Monday, right, this is my week, that last crew, those bunch of jokers never emptied it out. I was the only one doing this job for the next, right, this is the point where today we want to get on social media. Thus says the Lord. This is what God is telling us. We all need to No, Sometimes you just got to keep that to yourself. That's what God told me to do. And there's things he's telling you to do. And you don't need to get online and tell everybody, this is what you got to do. Sometimes it's just between you and the Holy Spirit. Six months later, I went on vacation, and the, the guys on my team are asking me, now who's going to be doing your job when you're gone? I was like, what, what job is that? They're like, you know, the diaper trailer. I'm like, excuse me. This is not my job. This is our, our job. But what I didn't know behind the scenes is there's a position that's opening up, and they're looking for somebody to put in there. Who do they put in there? They put me in there. Got promoted into one of the best jobs in the warehouse. Kind of really set the stage for what I'm doing today. I did not know that, but the Holy Spirit knew that. A month after I got promoted, right, I sat back to to watch the crew. Who? Who's going to have to dump the trailer? Now they're going to know. I was carrying them all for the last year. Ha! No, head of the warehouse got rid of the trailer, contracted with the waste management, put a dumpster in the back of the warehouse. Are you kidding me? Where was this idea two years ago? What? The Holy Spirit said no. They lost their vehicle for promotion. See, so many times we want to get started there at, at, the, at the finish line. You have a dream on the inside of you. But sometimes that's not the starting line. Sometimes, man, are you willing to just humble yourself? What, whatever. See, the, the, what the Holy Spirit does is he comes with you and he helps you make whatever's in front of you, make that glorious. Make that honorable. How do you do that? It's with your attitude. It's with the presence of God that comes with you. It's the perfecting of the saints, right? And so there's something on the inside of the Holy Spirit just keeps working on us with people. Come on, let's let's back up two chapters. Ephesians chapter two. Man, I love the, the book of Ephesians. You know, there are a couple of different themes going on here. 
Paul lays out in the beginning. I want you to, he raised us up and made us sit together with him. And then uh, after a couple more chapters, Paul says, okay, now that you've been seated, now that you're looking to see what Jesus did for you, now I want you to walk. Now begin to walk this out, right? You start out by being raised up to see what God did for you. But there's also another theme in Ephesians, and it's how insiders and outsiders are being brought together into one group. Right? The disciples understood this, that being the Jews and the Gentiles, right? One group, and there's another group. One group is blessed, and yet it couldn't, couldn't be with other people. And so Jesus came and tore that division down, tore those dividers down. And so what happens now is that there's something great on the inside of us that begins to reach out to other people. You know, I started out uh, just excited. Man, I knew I was called to the ministry, so I just volunteered for everything I could get my hands on, right? I was like the excited volleyball player when I was volunteering. You ever play volleyball with somebody like me? Man, wherever the ball is, that's where I'm going. <laughs> just, I understand we have positions when we start, <laughs> three, four, five, six. But as soon as that ball is hit, I am just wherever the ball is. I'm having too much fun. And I approached volunteering the same way, right? I want to do everything. So I volunteered in the youth department. I was there for 11 years, 11 years, two months, two weeks, and four days total. I was there helping them out. Who's keeping track? I was. Worked on that same job. I told you about cutting the grass and then getting promoted. I was there eight months, four, eight years, four months, and 20 days. Hallelujah. But I approached volunteering. I was just excited. So I'm in junior high, right, helping out. It just seemed good. How do you find your spot? One thing that you do is you follow life. It just seemed good to go volunteer. It just seemed good to put an application in here. It just, it just seemed good. Fi follow life. Find that and keep following that. That's the Holy Spirit who's leading you. And so I knew I wasn't called to the youth, but it just seemed good. Then I go help them out. And so then I went into junior high. So we have about 175 junior high kids a week. We had about 80 leaders. So we would have an organizational meeting on Wednesday nights an hour beforehand. And I just wanted to volunteer for everything. I just was excited to serve. But I was getting in the way. We need somebody to, to do this before service. Oh, me, 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 me. I will. Okay, all right, fine. We also need somebody to do this before service. Me, 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 me. Okay. We need somebody inside and outside at the same time. I'll do them both. I'll figure it out. I'm David Fleming. <laughs> and after a few months, I'm doing everything. Like, I'm doing everything. I really am. Bunch of slackers I'm working with. Bunch of jokers. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit nudges you. Hey, come on. He's going to help you with people. If, you're gonna, if you listen to him, he will make you look good with people. He will help you. So he actually, on this particular occasion, he had actually had me stand back. Sounded like sacrilege. Are you kidding me? I gotta be a part of everything. I'm, I'm just trying to serve Jesus. No, I want, you to, I want you to wait. So he gave me this picture in the organizational meeting. Why don't you sit on your hands and count to three before you raise your hand? And then after a couple of weeks, he's like, why don't you count to five? Okay, count to 10. <laughs> Because all of a sudden I began to realize, oh, it's not just me trying to find the plan of God. I'm surrounded by, okay, okay. See, you fit great on a team. You have gifts and talents that are perfect for a team. But you got to figure out how to work with people. And the truth is you will only go as far as your ability to work with people. Right? So this is what we're doing with the churches. We're helping with the churches, right? Because the size of the team that's helping is directly connected to the size of the ministry. And so you've got to learn, but thank God for the Holy Spirit. He's going to help you working with people. And so he taught me how to slow down, how to work with people. Stay on the team, right? We're not quitting, but we're not getting irritated and, and disgusted when somebody else gets to do no, what we want to work with people who have that hard attitude, they'll come in, how can I help you? I will do anything. How can I help you, right? I work with two different types of volunteers all through the years, thousands of people, and they start one of two ways. 
People either come in with a lot of bluster, or let me tell you what I've done. I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. I've done this, I've done that, I've done, I can do, I can do this. Or there's people that show up and say, how can I help you? What do you need? Do you know which group lasts longer? And the Holy Spirit is going to help you how to work with people. Do you, right, we all know what the love chapter is. What's the love chapter there in 1 Corinthians? Everybody know that one? 1 Corinthians 13, right? Isn't there just wonderful pictures Paul is painting? But do you realize the context of the love chapter? Paul just finished talking in chapter 12 about how we're supposed to work. Do you realize that's the context of the love chapter? He just began to describe 1 Corinthians 12. We're all different parts of the body. We all are different. We all have different things that we do, right? You have different gifts, different operations, different gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, in light of that, we got to talk about walking in love with people. And I'm going to give you one answer of how you work with people. You got to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. He is the answer for everything. He's where you get the transformation from. He's where you get the call from, the anointing from. See, the truth is, is that the pastor didn't call you. He didn't anoint you. (laughs) But God has asked you, will you come and serve? So I'll be honest with you. I've done thousands of things. Jobs I liked, jobs I did not like. But I gave my best right where I was. The kingdom of God operates on faithfulness. Will you just be faithful with what is in front of you? What is it that you have? Give your best right there. And while we're working, we're looking for the best in other people, looking for the good in other people, praying that out. You know, I remember uh, years ago in, in junior high, uh, we had a team of people, right? So I, I got my attitude right, got back in line. Sometimes that happens a lot, Right. Yeah, sometimes you got to talk to yourself. I've learned every time I came to volunteer that I needed to just pray on the way there just to remind myself, why am I doing this? That's how you make it 11 years, week in, week out. Keep reminding yourself every single time you come, why am I doing this? I'm doing this for Jesus Christ. Because you're coming to an opportunity where you're going to get offended and want to quit. It just happens. You can have wonderful opportunities to offend other people, to cause them to want to quit. You keep your eyes on Jesus. This is how we do it. So one of the themes there in Ephesians is Paul saying that God is able to take the differences for all of us and bring us together into one body, into one group. All right? That's one of the themes of Ephesians. It says, let's look in Ephesians 2. Let's start in, in verse 8, 8 through 10. Well, let's, let's back up to verse 4. Andrew, let's go to verse 4. Right? So this is part of the story here. But God, who is rich in mercy, come on, God has been good to you. He's been good to you. He's just not halfway merciful to you. He's not keeping track of the mistakes that you're doing. The Bible says God is rich in mercy because of his great love. I love how Paul describes this. His great love wherewith he loved us. When we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with him, raised us up, made us sit together with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness to us through Christ Jesus. You see, when you see the picture of Jesus, when you see the story of Jesus, that's supposed to be a sign to you that God loves you. Come on, does somebody love you? Like, like practically, like somebody you can pinch and poke. Does somebody love you? How do you know? How do you know when somebody loves you? Is it just a feeling? Oh, I just feel loved. Is it a feeling? Isn't it something that you can like point to? So uh, years ago, I started dating this girl. Got, I got married when I was uh, 41. 41 is a little older in the church. Can you imagine I was a traveling minister for 10 years? Can you imagine what that was like? People <laughs> trying to set you up everywhere you went, trying to, trying to rig the lunches. 
I thought they were inviting me in because I liked me. <laughs> no. No, and I figured it out because then once I got married, uh, some places I never got invited back to. <laughs> All right. But I found this girl, and she was wonderful there in Tulsa. She was serving. For me, that's, that, that was like, oh, who is this girl? This girl serves a lot. Right? I was a traveling preacher teaching about serving. Here she was doing a lot of stuff. She was just a great friend of mine. So we started dating. One time I went to, to pick her up. She was working at a bank. So she's in a house with, with some, some girls, some friends of mine. And right, I go by after work sometimes and pick her up, ring the doorbell, and she'd open up the door just smiling right at me. Yeah. <laughs> the best part of my day. I'm thinking, how do I, how do I get this every day? Well, there's a way that you do that, yeah. <laughs> I picked her up one time, and uh, she said, I have something for you. She pointed there in the kitchen, and there on the counter in the kitchen was like this, this cake, right, the 13 by 9 pan. It's got chocolate frosting on the top, and I was like, oh, man, I like chocolate. <laughs> so what is it? She said, it's yellow cake with chocolate frosting. I was like, that's my favorite. My favorite cake is yellow cake with chocolate frosting, right? I'm Irish. I'm pretty plain. I'm dull. You don't want me picking food. <laughs> but I like what I like. It's not flashy. And I was like, that's my favorite. She said, I know. I was like, how did you know? She, well, in passing, four days before, I had just mentioned I like yellow cake with chocolate frosting. I don't even know what flavor it is. It's just yellow. <laughs> it's not fussing about the details. Let's just get the cake. And there the cake is on the counter. I'm thinking... That's for me? Yeah, made it for you. You, you. you made this for me. Yeah. She said, you mentioned it the other day. It's your favorite. So I'm thinking to myself, she hears it. She remembers it. She goes to the store. She buys the stuff. She puts it together. She bakes it. Here it is. I think she likes me. <laughs> We go on this date, October, right? Oklahoma is not famous for leaves. Have you ever seen a travel flyer for Oklahoma? Come look at the leaves changing color. No, nah, you never will. <laughs> Just goes from green to brown, right, Brother Joe? <laughs> Nothing. So we go to the next state over, to the mountains in Wichita. I plan this whole day. I'm off this weekend, you know. We drive for this all day. I bring a little lunch, right? And we, we go to a rest area. I find a, a couple of spots to go on a hike, right? So we're kind of new in the dating scene and trying to figure out who this girl is. Well, she showed up for a, for, a, for a day trip with tennis shoes on. I like this, right? She's a girly girl, gets her hair done, gets her nails done, but right? she didn't show up in heels. All right, I like this. So we go on this little walk, about a two-mile walk to a waterfall, and she loves getting the picture taken. And so we're walking, and I just keep checking in on her. You okay on the walk? From, oh, she's liking this walk. I was like, man, I got a hearty girl. This is, no, is kind of fun here. Girl can do all kinds of things. So we get to the end there, and there's this waterfall. Now, I come from a long line of engineers, right? We like to figure things out on our own. We like to figure out, why is it doing that? And the water's coming out of a cave, and we're getting our picture taken. But I'm like starting to think, where's that water? Where's that coming from? I'd like to, I know I'm on a date, but man, this is kind of uh, exciting. Let's get a picture closer to the waterfall, you know? And speaking her language. And I'm like, I still can't quite see. It's like, hold right here. I'm going to be right back. And I climb up this big rock, and I'm in the cave, and my eyes are adjusting to the dark, and I'm, there's a light way in the corner, and there's a little water. I'm like, I just got to know where the water, I know I'm on a date. I'll be right back. I'm an engineer. I got to figure this out. And there in the dark, something rubbed up against me. <laughs> now I'm going through my Oklahoma, Arkansas, you know, what kind of animals are in caves? <laughs> You know, I don't want to be calling out for help. Help, help me. I don't want to be rescued on this date. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be the man here, I'm trying to take care of this girl, tell her I can protect you, and I don't want to be rescued. Oh. It was her. She had climbed in the cave with me and wanted to 
be there. You mean she's in the dirt and the muck and the mud. She, she just wants to be with me. And I grab her hand and we come through the dark and we come out into the sun. And I just grabbed her and I think to myself, I, I think I love this girl. She's on an overnight trip volunteering at the church and we get this random Oklahoma snowstorm, about six inches of snow. She's coming back with the church. You know, there's about 50 ladies on the street, a couple of buses. And I think, ah, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go clear the snow off the windshield of her car. Yeah. And I go there and I'm like so excited, like windshield's done. I don't see the bus, so I uncover the entire car, right? There's 50 cars in the parking lot and one car is completely uncovered. And then I think to myself, where is the bus going to park? Where is she going to walk? And so I scrape out this path where I think the bus is just to her car. See, that, it's that love compels you to do something, do something for somebody. Right, look, come on, let's look at this again. Ephesians 4, but God who's rich in mercy because of his great love didn't just stay in heaven and tell you, I hope you made it. He did something for you. When you were dead in sins, raised you. Come on, we're not telling the Easter story fully. We see Jesus go down. Jesus comes up in the drama. Yes. Oh, but he raised you with him. That's the sign that God loves you. That's the sign that he's been good to you. So you keep that in front of you. Every time you go to work with people, you got to keep reminding yourself, God, you've been so good to me. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you so much. And it's that revelation that comes to you and just transforms your life. And you think to yourself, I'm never going to be the same again. He's been so good to us, and we, we serve with that same gratefulness. That's how you make it, working with people. That's how you do it. That's how you do it right there. Keep reminding yourself of Jesus Christ. Keep going over the story. Keep going over this. You've been so good to me. Years ago, I was helping out at a church, came through in the southeast in uh, October, and they were having a, like a fall fest, you know, one of those big events for kids. Come on out. We're going to do a bunch of little games, and we're going to pass out candy. So uh, I know how to do this, right? I'm, I'm a traveling minister, but I know how to serve. And the reason why I still serve as a full-time traveling minister, I still serve because serving is the place of the followers of Jesus Christ. That's where it takes place. So they said, we're having an event on Friday. I said, man, I'll come. I know how to do these things. So I showed up for 12 hours. I'm pulling up bags of candy, you know, putting, putting this whole big bin together with the candy, setting up games. I can do it. They asked me to run a game. I can run a game. There's about 20 games outside. One of the volunteers gave us a shoebox size of candy, full of candy. They gave me some rules. Now, Brother Dave, just pass out two pieces of candy for every kid that wins the game. Two. Right, I'm good with numbers. I can do this. I can count. One, two. Here you go. Move on. One, two. Here you go. Move on. The event is only a couple hours long, and 15 minutes in, this lady, another volunteer comes through and fills up all of our bins. Right, so now my bin is piling over again. So one, two, passing it out. One, two, passing out. One, two. A few minutes later, she fills it up again. Hold on a second here. Right, so I'm starting to think, how much candy can I give away before this lady comes back? Right, I'm playing my own game. <laughs> get down almost about halfway she fills it up again and now I start looking at the time I know how much candy we have and I realize we've got too much candy two doesn't cut it 
I got to start giving away more candy in order to get rid of this. To me, all right, we've done it wrong. If we finish the event and we still have all the candy and the kids have none, right? So we're no longer playing the game anymore. I'm just getting people around me here. I'm doing like handfuls. You picked the candy. Up to that point, I was like, hmm, let me look at you. Okay, I'll give you these two pieces of candy. And everyone was like, you pick it. You pick it. Where's the dad? Come on, dad, right? The dads are standing back pretending, I don't like candy. I don't need sugar. <laughs> I see the twinkle. I see the twinkle. Come on, Dad. Do it for your other kids or, you know, something, right? I'm, we're just handing out the candy, handfuls of candy. She, this lady fills it up again. Oh, man, we're having too much fun. Just getting rid of all the candy, the candy, the candy. You don't even have to play the game anymore. You just got to... If, if I can get to you, if I can just get to you, if I can just get to you... And then I realized this is the grace of God. And I realized I, I had been treating people my entire life like I had limited candy. People were coming into my life and I was like, mm, let's see, yeah, you did good. You played the game, two pieces. Now run along, I don't... Come back around again, maybe another time. Oh, you played the game. Here's, here's two pieces. Here's two pieces. You, nope, you didn't win the game. Sorry. Why don't you try and come on back? See, as long as I thought I had limited candy, I was limited in how I gave it out. But when I realized I have unlimited candy, oh, I got, I got handfuls, I got handfuls, I got handfuls, I got handfuls. I'm not even looking at you. We're not even playing the game anymore. We're just dishing it and dishing it and dishing it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you play for us? Hallelujah. We're just dishing it out. So you have abundance. You have access to abundance. So when you walk into school, you come in with abundance. Abundance. You've been placed there. You've been set there in this season. <sighs> so I want you to look higher than what you've been looking. I want you to look up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't, the Holy Spirit already, he already knows what all the problems are. He already gets it. It's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. He knows that. He knows that. It's part of why he put you there. You've been place there so when you walk in come on any other teachers any other teachers in the room any other teachers any other people you work with you work in the public you work with people yeah you've been placed there you've been placed there come on we got to get a revelation oh we have we have access to unlimited grace come on the grace of god is so rich towards you so and it's not just for you it's for your whole world and I realized I was I was stingy with people because I thought I thought based on my performance I don't think I qualify for much candy so I don't have a whole lot to give you either what little I qualify I kind of need it but when you get a revelation of Jesus Christ, that he's been good to you, that he loves you. He's not keeping track of your sin. He's, he's forgiven it. He paid the price on the cross for it. So now every time you come into the presence of God, he's filling you back up. Man, I realized for years I was making everybody play a game. Or before I'm nice to you, you got to play a game. And what was the game I made everybody play? How did you treat David Fleming? You did good. Here you go. You did good. Here you go. You did good. Here you go. You did. Uh, somebody else. Ah, you didn't do so good. I have nothing for you. No, when I understood I had abundance, there's no, we're no longer playing a game anymore. We're no longer playing the game. You just got to be near me. I need you to be near me in order for me to... I got access to abundance. I have access to grace. I have access to favor. And it's too much just for me. You might as well take some too. 
He's been so good to me. The enemy's doing everything he can to get you to keep looking at yourself. Do you qualify? Who do you think? And the answer is stop looking at you. Stop looking at your performance. Stop looking at the mistakes that you made. Stop looking at what's in front of you. Look to Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus. You keep looking at Jesus. Goes on to say, Ephesians 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Everybody say good works. Which God before ordained that we should walk in them. So I believe there's two things Paul is saying here. We are his workmanship. I believe what he's saying is that when you get that transformation, when you accept Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus comes into your life and begins to restore, rebuild, renew, brings hope back alive in those dreams. You are his workmanship. But I believe there's also another theme where he is saying, we are his workmanship. All the different people, all the different experiences, all the different ways that you got here, the Holy Spirit brings us into the church and he unites this group right here. And this group begins to work together gets past those differences. Well, how come you do it that way? Why are you doing it like that? Do you realize how different we all are? Like this group right here. If we wanted to, we could take a poll of this group right here. People are like, how come we're sitting in blue chairs? How come those chairs are red? Why are we meeting at 1030? I think we should meet at nine o'clock. Somebody else says, I think we should meet at 1130. Somebody else says the music was too long. Somebody else says the music wasn't long enough. It's too loud. It's not loud enough. Why don't we dim the lights? Why don't we sing this song? Do you realize how different we are in this group right here? And it's the work of the Holy Spirit to take this group and make them into a church. We are His workmanship. We get there by keeping our eyes on Jesus. He's been so good to us. Come on, anybody here, you've never been born again. Let's start right there. Never been born again. This is the beginning of the family. How do you get there? You get there by believing in Jesus Christ, right? Have you gone over the story, what he did for you? He was a real man. He lived a sinless life. He paid the price for your sins. He died on the cross. But the Bible says that he was raised from the dead. He is alive today. Bible says, do you believe that? Will you take one more step? Will you confess it? That's how you become born again. Anybody here, you say, I've never done that before. Hallelujah. That's how you start. And so we 